Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Q at HP Discover 2014. Brought to you by HP. Good morning from Las Vegas, everybody. This is Dave Vellante, and this is The Cube. The Cube is SiliconANGLE's flagship production. We're here live at HP Discover. We go out to events like HP Discover and many others. We extract the signal from the noise. Today we're focusing a lot on the server business. Last night we saw Antonio Neri unveil a new system from HP, a new water-cooled system that we're going to talk about a little bit. I'm very excited because I've seen water-cooled you know, go full circle from the, <laughs> well, predated even my uh, uh, entrance into the computer industry, but now we're, we're, it's back. Uh, and what you're going to see is very interesting. Alain Andrioli is here. He's the Vice President and General Manager of the Density Optimized and Service Provider and HPC Business at HP. And John Gramala, uh, John, we were talking off camera, I think it's the seventh time, maybe eighth time you've been on theCUBE, so welcome, Wonderful. gentlemen. Thanks, yeah, great, great to, to see talk you guys. To you guys. So, Ellen, I want to start with you. Um, talk a little bit about this group that you run. Uh, it's, the hyper, uh, it's the hyperscale group, essentially. Um, talk about its mission and you know, how you're going after that market. There is a, there is a revolution uh, taking place in the world of computing. Uh, it's hyperscale. So you are moving from traditional enterprise applications to uh, more and more service providers, enterprise uh, uh, high-performance computing, and then the private cloud in the enterprise. This is driving a new generation of data centers. So the organization that we have created concentrates around the key aspects of this transformation. We have a product line that is density optimized computing that really tackles with the, the needed higher density for, for the compute. And then we have two vertical markets, one which is uh, service providers for the cloud, for the web, and one which is high performance computing. And these two segments are the fastest growing ones in the whole market. And they are together moving from one third of the market today to over half of the market in the next two to three years. And this is what our group is leading for HP servers. So, hyperscale, we talk a lot about hyperscale on theCUBE. We've, we've noticed that a lot of the hyperscale trends are starting to bleed into the enterprise. In fact, some folks have said, if you want to know what's going to happen in the enterprise, look what's happening inside of these giant hyperscale companies if you can peek inside and parts of it will, will seep into that enterprise. Do you, do you buy that premise? It's a kind of a circle, if you wish. We're talking about a circle for water cooling. We can talk about water cooling yeah, later yeah, on. Yeah. But it's the same for the hyperscale momentum. It started with the largest providers of the cloud, all who provide very, very optimized and unique monolithic workloads. The Googles, the Amazon, the Facebook, the Microsoft, and then the ones a little smaller, what we call the tier two service providers, are looking at what they are doing, and then the tier threes are looking at the tier twos, and then the enterprises, who are also building hyperscale clusters, are looking at what the service providers are doing. So you have this kind of, you know, uh, a, a pervasion in the market of the hyperscale happening that starts from the largest hyperscale providers, the service providers. Yeah, so that's a good way to look at it. So the tier one guys, a lot of people say it's a race to zero. I personally don't think it is. It's just massive volumes, huge innovation. And then the tier two and the tier three service providers in hyperscale are competing with the Amazons and the Googles by specializing in areas right. where they may not. And then enterprises, some of the enterprises, particularly financial services, are looking at what's going on in that hyperscale side saying, maybe we can drive similar efficiencies. It's a very interesting market dynamic. Um, specifically, you've got a situation where the, the true, the, the large scale hyperscale guys, they'll spend a lot of PhD time to save money over the long term, whereas the average enterprise doesn't have that you know, capability. They'll spend money to save time. Uh, so that's this, there, are, there are clearly differences, but one of the things that we noticed, maybe let's say five or six or seven years ago, conventional wisdom said that the hyperscale guys would just use commodity components and have the software defined, what's now called software defined, on top of it, high degrees of automation, and now you're seeing that change a little bit. They're going highly customized, right? So what will happen in the enterprise? Will the enterprise go in that similar cycle? Commodity, software defined, that's what you're hearing now. A lot of talk about, and then eventually come back to highly customized. HP knows a lot about 
customization. What are your thoughts on that? It's all about segmentation. Mm -hmm. The answer is yes and yes. <laughs> so I think that we are really cracking the code here at, at HP of what the market needs to be successful in this transformation. On one hand, you have the people who want to go to customization and ultra commoditization of the architecture around their workload. And that's why we have done this uh, disruptive joint venture with Foxconn. Mm -hmm. What we're going to be able to provide is bare metal, mm -hmm. customized to the needs of the biggest service providers on the planet and beyond. So for the people who go for you know, customization of the hardware for massive workloads, we will be the vendor with no way our scale can be, can be matched end to end. The HP brand and the power of Foxconn behind in terms of supply chain and chip engineering. For the enterprise side, there is a need for innovation. Some of them want to use bare metal, but some of them want some unique solutions to do compute solution with ultra performance, uh, 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 high density, and this is the Apollo product line. So we are going on the two fronts with a very differentiated approach and basically enterprises can choose which way they want to go depending on the level of capabilities that they want to build for the future. We, we talk about it in terms of workload optimized and there are differences in those workloads between enterprise uh, and those largest tier one, tier two customers. So especially the enterprises, they want the benefits of those scale out systems that hyperscale, but they still have some different requirements in manageability, and the enablement of things like OpenStack and where that's going are key enablers that will take place over the next few years as well. Well, that's a great point because the average age of the enterprise application is probably 15 to 20 years. Absolutely. The average, you know, whereas a Google or a Facebook, I mean, a lot of people say they have one app, and they have you know, maybe one main app and a lot of little apps around exactly. it, but a whole different paradigm, isn't it? So how do you, what parts of the hyperscale service that enterprise sort of application mm -hmm. portfolio and, 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 and what parts are new maybe around the edge that maybe they're developing mobile apps. I wonder if you could talk about that dynamic a little bit. Well, it's even a case, let's take HPC as an example. Yep. You know, HPC used to be something that was more government and academic in terms of where it was prominent and it has really started expanding where it's a key tool for enterprises now oh, yeah. and that has all those same hyperscale characteristics it's a key piece of how you deal with those things, so we can take all of those benefits and apply it to how engineering, technical folks do their core work and what they're doing with a lot of the new platforms that we've hey, got. A lot of the big data stuff in HPC are kind of colliding Correct, as well. Correct, exactly. Both of those are benefits. So let's talk about some exciting stuff. I talked about water cool before. Dust off your thermodynamics, you know, 101. Uh, uh, engineers <laughs> out there, you'll love this segment. So talk about inside of what you announced last night or unveiled last night, you've got a, a new system that's water cool, but we think water cool, we think chillers, right? We think frost on the, on the outside of the, the pipes. Talk about the innovation that you guys have developed inside of Apollo. Go ahead, do you want to? Yeah, well, so, you know, it's been four years in the making. We've been looking at uh, the HPC market uh, coming for a potential explosion, uh, like a second life for HPC. As John was saying, it used to be pretty specialized in academia and research and so on, government, and now it's going mainstream. So we said if this is going mainstream, it's got, got to be really disruptive in terms of technology and innovation. And the more power you put, the, heat, the hotter it gets. So cooling is actually the first problem we've been trying to address. And you can see here our dry disconnect technology, which is unique, and I can maybe briefly explain the issue with water cooling is that you have risk of leakages on the electronics. With this technology, the water is going in a bus in the chassis, totally separated from electronics, and then you have a liquid here which goes into vapor with the heat, get cooled down back into liquid here on the bus, and then back into vapor as it gets into the heat, and we have achieved an extreme efficiency with a ratio of 1.06 of energy utilization, which is totally unmatched. So that's yeah, the point Yeah, 1.0 is nirvana. 1.0 is, is, is like, is, you know. It's impossible to achieve, but yeah. it's possible to achieve, but it's perfect. One watt in, one watt <laughs> yeah, out, yeah, right, impossible. Yeah, right, right. So 1.06 means extreme efficiency. That's what we have achieved. Uh, unless you're including the reuse though, you could actually go with, you know, PUEs that are lower by having the reuse of the technology of the uh, waste heat as well. So you get even greater efficiencies when you reuse 
uh, a lot of the heat from that liquid cooling as well. Now, we were talking last night, this is not chilled water. How, how did you achieve that innovation? Talk yeah, about again, it's about a, a warm water cooling, so you take air temperature water and, and actually put that in the system. Since the actual chips are running at a much higher temperature, you can use that difference in that temperature alone to go ahead and cool the system. And that is adequate to you know, the, the deliver the reliability and availability that you need. Absolutely, and different, you know, different uh, customers and vendors will actually decide whether they want to do just straight cooling of that or whether they want to reuse that heat. There's so many benefits in taking that warm water and reusing it to heat uh, facilities or actually you know, doing a lot of, of offsetting of energy that's used for other purposes. Where did this innovation come from? Was it inside of the, the, your, the, the, the server division R&D? Was it a collaboration with HP Labs? Can you talk about that a little bit? Both, it started from HP Labs, mm -hmm. who invented this, this mm -hmm. kind of uh, dry disconnect uh, Can I see? methodology. Yes, please. Okay. And, uh, and then you know, we productionize mm -hmm. it within HP servers, making it an overall, an overall system architecture. Okay, so the, the, the ambient water comes in here, and it's, and, it's, and it's cool enough relative to the electronics. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Right. And this liquid is kind of, of magic. You, you can kind of simulate. Imagine that you have, and you can see these on the booth. Imagine that you have an ice with glass and heat. You put one of these tubes, imagine these tubes would be straight. Mm -hmm. You put one of these tubes in the ice, immediately you feel the, 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 the ice on your, on your finger. You put a normal piece of metal, it will take a few seconds to go up and you will have a lot of dissipation of, of the cold. If you do it, do it in, a, in a hot pot of water, you will have the same result very, very quickly. This is really breakthrough. And the material here is what? This is copper. It's copper, okay. But it's Great. got a vacuum internal to it with the liquid. So you'll actually get to the point where that liquid will boil. If you want to call it that change to vapor. And by changing from liquid to vapor, that actually uses a lot of energy and transfers it very effectively across that system. I want to ask you guys, um, short on time, but uh, the OCP initiative uh, out of Facebook, is that something that you guys are looking at, something that you're actually actively investing in? I wonder if you could give us your Yes, we are there. participant in the, in the OCP movement. Uh, we have discussions and meetings and products available. We, we work with uh, Rackspace, we work with Facebook, and we are trying to find ways where you know, some segments of the market, probably in particular financial services, will find benefits in working with this type of architecture. Customers need to look at the overall cost of ownership, total cost of ownership, not individually the price of, of the product, but our joint venture with Foxconn will be supporting this type of generic servers and architecture. That's an OCP in the future. like architecture. OCP, yeah. WCS, and yeah, you know, yeah, this type okay, of great. Scorpio I think it's more of a bigger trend towards overall open design yeah. principles. Right. Um, and we even have a session here at the event on OCP and those open design principles. Uh, last question is how big, so if the, if the enterprise market is X, I don't know, let's well, say X is 100 billion, what percent of that market does your do your solutions, do you think, attack? Is it a... 36%. <laughs> that's your number? This that's year. Your, that's your TAM? This year, yes. Okay, so that's a TAM figure? Of the total market, yeah, that's 36%. Your, that's your total TAM. available market is 36% of the overall yes. enterprise. Yes. That's a today statement, though, today. isn't it? That's a today work? statement. Today. So over time, it's obviously going to increase it, we, quite We believe it will pass 50% in 2017. So this is the future, um, you believe. I, I believe it too, by the way. I think these, I, I, I've, I've one of the people who said, you want to know what's going to happen in the enterprise, look what's happening in hyperscale. And we will continue to have a very nice you know, business in, in, in the enterprise because traditional application, applications uh, will, will, will continue. And then there is the SME market, which is not going to go hyperscale. Right. So you have SME, then you have traditional apps in the large enterprise, then you have HPC, and these are different segments that you have to segment by workloads to understand where this is all but going. But where the, where the SMB market will go hyperscale is through the tier two, uh, tier three cloud service providers, right, that will hop on this technology. Eventually, right? but not totally. Yeah, not tomorrow. Not but, totally yeah. and not everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, that's a great segment. Thank you guys so much for coming on. We got to leave it there. Thank you, Dave. Thank all you right. very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from Las Vegas. Right back.